Okay, so actually the title is Automorphic Forms on Higher Rank Groups, at least the official title. Uh, Okay, well, th there will obviously be, obviously be some overlap with other lectures, um, but that's probably not a bad thing. So I guess Philippe, in his lectures, has focused on the group SL2R. Yeah, I didn't want to get a Aha. Okay. Well, never mind. Um, <laughs> yes, in any case, SL2R is the underlying group um, for classical automorphic forms. And there are many ways to generalize this due to certain special out, uh, isomorphisms. One can view SL2R as the connected component of SO21. And then the natural thing to generalize this is to look at SON1. Of course, you can generalize this even more and look at SOPQ, but let's not be too general. Another way to look at SL2R is to view it as SP2R, or depending on your taste, SP1R. Um, and then the natural generalization is SP2NR. Or, what Emmanuel suggested, um, you can view this as PGL2 plus R. Plus means positive determinant. And then the natural generalization is PGLN R. Now, this has rank 1. so. Strictly speaking, this is not a higher rank group, but in some other sense, it is a higher rank group. It has rank, R, rank 1 over R, but over QP, it may have much larger rank, so perhaps it does qualify as something of higher rank. This has rank N, and this has rank N minus 1. I will mostly focus on PGLN, but I will also mention some things about uh, hyperbolic spaces and um, sim the symplectic group Siegel modular forms. OK, um, so let me start with, with hyperbolic spaces. OK, so we are interested in, in automorphic forms on SON1. And to get started, we need some coordinates. So we start with the Iwasawa decomposition of SON1. And well, abstractly, it's a product of three groups, N, A, and K. So I'm not quite sure how to. Um... No, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm just trying to find out how to organize uh, the blackboards appropriately. Perhaps I'll just continue here. Okay. So K is the maximal compact subgroup. That's most easy to describe. This is one, and then S O N. So that's obviously isomorphic to SON. And then A determines the rank. And you can easily see it's a rank 1 group. It depends on one parameter. And then 
The rest is the identity matrix. So that's isomorphic to SO11, perhaps connected component of the identity. Um, and N is a bit harder to describe. Um, it's easier to describe the corresponding Lie algebra, and then N is just the exponential of, of, uh, of the Lie algebra. And so it's matrices of the form identity plus a matrix N plus a matrix N squared over 2. That's the beginning of the Taylor series expansion, and it turns out that the rest is 0. Where N is of the following form, N is, well, this N is not this N. Um, so this is a matrix N. Uh, take a different font, yeah? Um, so it's, it's a matrix of dimension N plus 1, and it has a vector here of dimension N minus 1, and the same vector again. And it has a vector here with a minus sign and the same vector here. And the rest is 0. So this is a vector in R to the n minus 1. And this is isomorphic as a group to R to the n minus 1. OK, so um, there, are, uh, there are other ways to uh, choose coordinates. Um, here I'm assuming that my quadratic form is something like minus x squared and then plus y squared plus z squared plus w squared. So it's minus 1 plus 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 1 and so on. Um, sometimes, OK, so let's write this down. OK, is this gone forever? OK. Um, so this uses the underlying quadratic form minus 1 and then 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Um, or I don't know, maybe the signs are different. Maybe it's 1 and then minus 1, 1, whatever. But this is obviously a, a, a form of signature 1n. Um, often, the quadratic form one, one, and then this is used. So this, all, this has one hyperbolic plane, and then um, here it's the identity matrix. So this is also a form of signature 1n is used. And then everything looks a little bit different. OK, so hyperbolic space is SON1 modulo SON. And that's a natural generalization of the upper half plane. And indeed, if, if n equals 2, and perhaps I have to take the connected component here uh, of, the, of the identity matrix, if n equals 2, then this is just the usual upper half plane. And if n equals 3, this is what Akshay introduced yesterday. That's hyperbolic 3 space. Um, and again, there are, there are several models of, uh, of this hyperbolic space. There is the hyperbolic model. This is the set of all x0 up to xn in the positive reals times the reals to the power n, such that x0 squared minus x1 squared up minus xn squared equals 1. And then you have a natural action of SON1 on this hyperboloid. Maybe more familiar to you if, you're, if you have grown up with, uh, 
uh, with the usual upper half plane is the upper half space model. There are n coordinates in this case. Here we have n plus 1 coordinates, but one uh, equation. Here we have n coordinates, and we just require the last coordinate to be positive. So in the case n equals 2, this is just the usual xy complex plane. And there is a third um, description in terms of Clifford algebras, which is sometimes quite useful. And let me spend a little bit of time defining the relevant objects. Cn is the Clifford algebra, which you may or may not he have heard of. So the Clifford algebra is an algebra um, of dimension 2 to the n. So as a vector space, it has dimension 2 to the power n. And a vector space basis is given as follows. We take the power set of some basis elements, i1 up to in. So I take n elements, and then I take the power set. And so I get, obviously, 2 to the n elements. And I interpret a subset, uh, so any element in this power set is a subset of, uh, of this set i1 up to i n, and I interpret it as the product. Um, you'll, uh, I'll give examples soon. Um, so this is a, a bit uh, up using notation, so strictly speaking. The basis is, so it's, it's r plus r i1 plus up to r i n, and then all products are i1, no, wait, i1, i2, and r i1, i3, and so on. So it's a product and not really a subset, but it's clear how to, how to do this. And so this uh, defines the Clifford algebra as a vector space, which is not particularly interesting. Uh, it's an algebra, so we need some multiplication relations. And I called them i because they play a similar role as i of complex numbers. So in particular, we have ij squared is minus 1 for all j. And we have IA, IB is minus IB, IA. This is what you know from Hamilton quaternions. And in fact, it turns out that the Hamilton quaternions are a special case of this. And there are some more relations. I mean, this is not enough to get all the relations, but there are, so the multiplication table is known. So as an example, C0 is just the real numbers, C1 is the complex numbers, and C2 is the Hamiltons. So C2 has, is R plus Ri plus Rj plus Rij, and Ij is K. OK, um, so inside Cn minus 1, we have an important vector space Vn minus 1. And this is the vector space consisting, 
so generated by all basis elements of degree at most one. So i1 plus plus up to i n minus one. So that's a vector space of dimension n inside the Clifford algebra of dimension 2 to the n minus 1. And I can view the upper half space hn, and this up there should be hn, as sitting inside this vector space. And in a, in a very natural way, if I take the upper half space model, then I have n coordinates, the last of which is uh, positive. And I simply map this to x0, x1, to xn minus 1. So I, do, I don't do anything in this map. OK, so you can view the, the upper half space as sitting inside a Clifford algebra. So in the, in the familiar case of n equals 2, it sits inside C1, and C1 is the complex numbers. That's what you know. The upper half plane is part of the complex numbers. And as Akshay mentioned yesterday, the upper half space, n equals 3, can be viewed as sitting inside the quaternions. Now, the important question is, how does the group, uh, uh, so, so how does the group SON1 act on this? Um, I mean, this is obvious in the hyperbolic model, um, but it's not so obvious in the upper half space model. And can, it can be very well described in this Clifford algebra model. There exists a set which I call SV. V stands for Wahlen, who more than 100 years ago uh, introduced this theory. SV of Cn minus 2, which is a subset of matrices, two by two matrices, with entries in the Clifford algebra Cn minus 2. acting on Vn minus 1 by fractional linear transformations. If I take a matrix G, a 2 by 2 matrix with certain, not all entries, but so not all of these matrices are allowed. I have to take a certain subset. But they are 2 by 2 matrices with entries in Cn minus 2. Then this is Az plus B times Cz plus D inverse. Now, this algebra is highly non-commutative. So um, the order does make a difference. I cannot write Az plus B over Cz plus D. I'm doing all of this in the, in the Clifford algebra, which is highly non-commutative. For G is A, B, C, D in S, V, C, N minus 2. And Z is in Vn minus 1. And this makes sense. So A, B, C, and D are elements in Cn minus 2. But of course, I can embed Cn minus 2 into Cn minus 1. And then I know what the product with an element in Cn minus 1 is. And it turns out, which is not easy to see, you have to show it, uh, that this is an invertible element in this, in this algebra. Not everything in this algebra is invertible, but it turns out that this element will always be invertible. Does it is the definition of SV? That um, yes. I, 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 probably, the, so the definition is a bit more complicated, but this is certainly one of the requirements. Um, and the definition of SV is rather complicated, uh, but I can give you the definition in simple cases. So here are some basic examples. SV of C0 is simply SL2R. So there is no extra assumption. It's just, uh, well, the determinant is 1. But other than that, it's just everything. The same holds for SV 
C1, this is just SL2C. But already SVC2 is quite complicated, or a bit more complicated. This is the set of all matrices G, A, B, C, D, two by two matrices with entries in the Hamiltons, such that the following holds. A D star minus B C star equals one. A B star and C D star are in V2. So they have, okay, I'll, I'll explain this in a, in a second. And what is star? Star is the involution. So star is the involution that maps x plus iy plus jz plus kw to x plus iy plus jz minus kw. So in particular, star is the identity on this vector space uh, v2, because v2 is defined by last vanishing coordinate, and uh, it changes the sign of the last coordinate. Okay, let's make a reality check. Um, what's the dimension of this? Uh, and th this turns out to be a group. Uh, what is the dimension of this group? Well, for each entry you have, over the reals, you have four possibilities, because these are Hamiltons, so this is dimension 16. Um, this means that the last coordinate vanishes, so this subtracts one dimension, another dimension, and here you have a random quaternion that has to be one, so this subtracts four more dimensions. So in total you have 16 minus one minus one minus four, it's dimension 10, you have 10 degrees of freedom over the reals, and the dimension of S041 is 10. Yeah, so this is good. Okay, so reality check. The dimension of SV CN minus two, uh, sorry, C2, is 16 minus four minus one minus one is 10, and that's the dimension of SO41. Okay. Um, so the most interesting case is um, okay. so the most interesting case, I guess, is the case n equals three. That's the case that Akshay mentioned yesterday. Well, perhaps the most interesting case is n equals two, but um, yeah, I'm supposed to talk not to talk on the case n equals two. Uh, so then. H3 is uh, SL2C modulo SU2. And as we have seen in the upper half space model, typically the coordinates are X, Y, and R in R3 such that R is positive. And um, so you can view this as a Hamilton quaternion with last vanishing coordinate. So this is sitting inside the Hamilton's with last vanishing coordinate. Okay, any questions? So, if you want to have further reading, literature on, especially on the hyperbolic three space, but also on hyperbolic n space and this Valen group and Clifford algebras and so on. Basically everything by Elstrott, Grunewald, and Menneken. They have several three author papers and you find everything in great detail in their works. What? There is a famous book. The book treats uh, hyperbolic three space in complete detail. You find everything you want to know, hopefully, in this book. Um, 
so that's, that's certainly the most important reference. But uh, this uh, hyperbolic end space is treated uh, in, in research papers. OK, so the Archimedean theory is very similar. The, the end case is very similar to the case n equals 2. simply because it's a rank one group. And um, in particular, so there is, there is one Laplacian eigenvalue. There's one spectral parameter. And one has similar, for instance, one has similar bounds towards Ramanujan. There is a Kuznetsov formula, which has a very similar shape as the original Kuznetsov formula. And you can find this in many works. You can find this in work of Reznikov. Um, Miatello, Wallach. And there is also a long paper by Cocktail, Lee, Piatetsky, Shapiro, and Sarnak. So the Archimedean theory is fairly similar to the classical case. Hecke theory is quite different. Because Hecke theory, so there are Hecke operators. If you take, a, if you take a, an arithmetic subgroup, you can define Hecke operators in, a, in the usual way. Um, but the Hecke theory is, is a bit different. Um, because over QP, SON1 may have large rank. Not necessarily, but depending on P. It can have large rank. And um, then the theory is a little different. So I mean, as Akshay said yesterday, Hecke operators, if they exist, um, change the picture completely. And uh, so Hecke theory is a, is a very important part. Uh, and the Hecke theory is more complicated. Because SON1 over QP may have rank n plus 1 over 2 Gauss bracket. So already in the case n equals 3, in the case n equals 2, you see 3 over 2, maybe 1.5, but if you take the Gauss bracket, it's still 1. But n equals 3. The rank can already be 2. And um, so if, if you have a given rank, then uh, at least morally, and in, in some sense very precisely, the Hecke algebra is generated by as many elements as the rank says. And um, so you see this. So if, if, um, if n equals 3, then the rank can be as large as 2. And uh, you can see this in the classical picture. Um, if you, if you uh, view this as automorphic forms over, a, uh, over an order in an, in an imaginary quadratic field, um, there are ramified primes. Well, ramified primes are not interesting. But there are split primes and inert primes. And if you have split primes, then you get two Hecke operators for both copies of the split primes. So example n equals 3, if p, the prime ideal, the rational prime ideal, uh, decomposes as p, p bar, then one gets two Hecke operators t, p, and tp bar. Um, of course, if, if p is, uh, so f f this happens for half of the primes. And if, if p is inert, um, uh, then of course you get only one. OK. 
So why is this interesting? I mean, you can define whatever you want, but um, does this have any arithmetic significance? Well, certainly the case n equals 3 has a lot of arithmetic significance because it's automorphic forms of an imaginary quadratic field. Uh, but what about higher rank, like or higher n, so higher hyperbolic spaces? What is the arithmetic significance? So here is an arithmetic example. Um, and that's associated with uh, theta series and quadratic forms. If you have a positive definite quadratic form, you can easily write down a generating series for the representation numbers and then you get a theta series. And because the quadratic form is positive definite, the rep representation numbers are finite and there are only non-negative representation numbers, so you have no problems with convergence and you get an, a modular form on the upper half plane. If you have an indefinite quadratic form, then this doesn't really work um, because there are infinitely many, uh, I mean, the representation numbers are infinite and you have negative, potentially you can, you, can, um, you can represent negative numbers. So it's not really clear how to define a theta series for an indefinite quadratic form. And uh, so Siegel developed the theory. So let Q be an integral quadratic form with signature n1. And somehow we want to define a theta series attached to this quadratic form. But the naive thing of just writing down generating series doesn't work. So <clears throat> Siegel introduces the following. He introduces the so-called majorant space a majorant of Q is a positive definite quadratic form. Well, it's a positive definite, say, symmetric real n by n matrix. Uh, in fact, n plus 1 by n plus 1 matrix. Matrix R. satisfying, okay, I continue over here, R Q inverse R equals Q. And one can show uh, that if you have one of them, you can easily write down all of them. So if you have one such matrix R, then all matrices are of the following form. These are of the form G, G transpose RG for G in SOQ. So the special orthogonal group attached to the quadratic form Q. So all of, all of the matrix matrices satisfying this are given by one and then you conjugate, um, well, it's not really conjugation, but uh, with, with uh, a matrix in SOQ. So that means G transpose Q, G equals Q. Okay, and now we are ready to define the corresponding theta series. And we define the theta series attached to the matrix Q as follows. It's, an, it's, a mat it's a function of two arguments. It has an argument in the upper half plane, and it has an argument in SOQ. And it's the sum over all vectors, integral vectors of dimension n plus 1. Exponential. So what you would like to do is something like H transposed, this is not correct what I'm writing down, but what you would like to do is something like H transposed QH times Z. This is what you would do, so then there is no G, this is what you would do if Q was positive definite. But since Q is not positive definite, this doesn't make sense. It doesn't converge. If you just take the X coordinate, then it's still okay, and for the y-coordinate, you do something different. 
So you do xq. And for the y coordinate, plus iy. And here you take g transpose rg for a fixed majorant. So you fix your favorite majorant, um, h, where z is x plus iy. Z is x plus i, y in the usual upper half plane. And g is in s, o, q. OK, this is, this is the so-called Siegel theta series. And it turns out it's a modular form in both variables. It's a modular form in Z as a, a usual modular form on the upper half plane with respect to some congruent subgroup, which depends on Q. Uh, so Q has a certain level, and then you have to mod out a certain congruent subgroup. And it's also a modular form in G. So in, in G, it's in the second argument, it's a modular form for something that's isomorphic to S O N 1, because Q has signature N 1. And in the first variable, it's an automorphic form, a usual automorphic form on the upper half plane. But if you keep the first variable fixed, then you get a nice, interesting automorphic form on S O N 1. So it is modular in Z and G. So there is some arithmetic significance uh, attached to these forms on, on hyperbolic spaces. OK, any questions? This is an analog of S. Stetson theorem. Um, well, in, in what sense? I mean, certainly it's, it's, it's um, I guess it's not, a, it's not cuspidal. Um, so in this sense, it's, uh, it has to do with Eisenstein series. And you can probably, I mean, if you keep G fixed and view it as a function in Z, then you can decompose it into Eisenstein series. Yes? Um, in what, I'm, I'm confused in what sense it's a modular form in uh, G. Don't you need like some discrete subgroup to say what? Means oh yeah, 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 yeah. Same, same with here. I mean, you you, you have to mod out by a, by a suitable discrete subgroup, uh, which depends on Q. Um, so it, Q, I mean, it depends on the arithmetic of Q. There is some level if you if you, you mod out by some congruent subgroup, both in Z, so bo in, in both variables. There was a question up there. Uh, how was the Hecke operators indexed? I mean. Uh, in SL2, our Hecke operators are indexed by Pn's for all n in Z. Or yes. in SL2C, you can uh, index Hecke operator by all prime ideals. By prime ideals. How is the Hecke operator uh, index in general? Good question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I think, um, at least in this case, I worked it out, and it turns out they are indexed by quaternions. So yeah, they, they are indexed by matrices. If, this is called the quasi-determinant, this expression here. And you can, if the quasi-determinant equals n, a real number n, uh, then this corresponds to, a heco, to, the, to the nth Hecke operator. Um, just as in the, yeah. Uh, so so the, the point is, this has to be, I mean, a priori, the quasi-determinant could be any Hamilton quaternion, but then it doesn't commute. So you have to take something from the center. And the center is just the reals in this case. And uh, so at least in this, in this description, uh, and for the case of C2, the Hecke operators are um, parametrized by quasi-determinant being n. Um, and I'm actually not sure how they are parametrized in general. And I doubt that you find this anywhere in the literature. <laughs> I mean, uh, for uh, SL2 case, the Hecke algebra is polynomial algebra of TP1 and TP2. Right. You can do it 
Uh, so, what, what, I mean, can we at least uh, find a polynomial algebra of some variables? Well, so, so if, you, if you forget this picture with the Wahlen algebra and just go back to SON1, then of course, I mean, this is a, this is a well-known group and you can read in Satake in the, in the, in the original paper, uh, everything, and, and I mean, you can just write down the, 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 the double cosets with the respective representatives. Um, but if, yeah, but if you want to have, if you want to decompose the double cosets into single cosets, uh, this is a complete nightmare if you want to do it in general. Um, yeah, anyway, I think very, very few explicit results are in the literature other than in the case n equals two and n equals three, which is classical. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so this was just a very, very brief introduction into hyperbolic spaces, just to give you an idea of some definitions so that if you at least know how to start. And equally briefly, I would like to discuss symplectic, uh, the symplectic group, and also give a few basic definitions. And then uh, after that, we move on to PGLN. Okay, so symplectic groups. Okay, so let me first define um, the symplectic group. And there is great confusion. Um, uh, some people call this sp2 and some people call this spn. Um, I call it sp2n, but if you don't like it, feel free to call it spn. So these are all matrices in SL2NR such that M transposed J M equals J, where J is the mother of all symplectic matrices minus identity. Identity. So this is the identity of dimension N and this is the identity of dimension N. And you can write this as explicitly as all matrices A, B, C, D in block notation, where A, B, C, and D are again matrices of dimension N, such that A, D transpose minus B, C transpose equals the identity. A, B transpose is B, A transpose. And C, D transpose is D, C transpose. In other words, these are symmetric. So this is the usual block notation that you find in most of the literature. Um, capital letters always denote dimension n matrices. OK, and there is a, an upper half space that I also call h, but it's not the h that we had in the, for the hyperbolic spaces. hn is the set of all matrices z equals x plus iy n by n matrices, but now over C, such that Z is symmetric and Y is positive definite. And you can embed this into the symplectic group as matrices I, X, I. So this is the same thing that you can know from the upper half plane. Um, and V, V inverse, where V is the square root of Y. So Y is positive definite, so you can take a square root. And um, this is the usual way to embed complex numbers into SL2R, where V is the unique symmetric matrix such that V transposed V equals Y. And, okay, so if I call this G, my group G, then this is just the quotient G modulo, a maximal compact subgroup. 
OK, and G acts on this upper half space in the usual way. Group action, a matrix A, B, C, D acts on a point Z, which is, in fact, a matrix, as AZ plus B times CZ plus D inverse. And again, you have to be careful um, with the order, because matrices are not commutative anymore. OK, and as usual, we take a, co a discrete subgroup. For instance, we can take sp2n over the integers, but we don't have to. And this comes with an inner product. There is an inner product. The inner product is just what you would, what you would guess. It's the upper half space modulo gamma. And then you take f1 of z, f2 of z bar times an invariant measure. And the invariant measure is dx dy over determinant y to the power n plus 1. So the classical case is the case n equals 1. And uh, then you just recover the usual thing. So these are the analog of mass forms. If you have holomorphic Siegel modular forms of a certain weight, then you have to include determinant y to some suitable power k as usual. OK, so this looks all very similar to what you probably know from the classical case, except that all numbers are now matrices. Uh, but formally, um, it's very similar in many respects. So why is this interesting? Again, I mean, you can generalize as much as you wish, but, but why is this interesting? Here's the motivation. And the motivation com comes again from quadratic forms. Motivation. Why do we want to study Siegel modular forms? So assume you're given a positive definite symmetric matrix, an n by n integral matrix, symmetric positive definite, and even. By even, I mean that the diagonal elements are even. Yeah? An, an even integral matrix is an integral matrix with even diagonal elements. And pick an integer, a positive integer, or yeah, positive, less than n, or less than or equal to n. For a matrix T of dimension m, with half integral entries and integral diagonal, symmetric and positive definite, study the representations of t by a. So what does this mean? Well, if t happens to be a number, so if m equals 1, then this is what you usually do. You want to know how many ways are there to write a given number as a sum of four squares. Um, but you can just as well ask, how many ways are there to write a, bi a given quadratic form, say a binary quadratic form, as a sum of four squares? So this is a, not representation of numbers by forms, but representation of forms by forms but lower dimensional forms. And in the special case, m equals 1, this is just numbers. But uh, you can a priori pick any m between 1 and n. So we can define the representation number. R a of t is the number of matrices g of dimension m times n. So in the classical case, m equals 1. This is a usual vector. 
such that one half G A G transpose equals T. And because uh, A is positive definite and T is positive, well, A is positive definite, this is a finite number. And you can encode these representation numbers into a theta series. Theta A of Z is the sum over all T, R Q, sorry, R A, R A of T, E of trace T Z. Yeah, you need the trace to go back to numbers. where Z lives in HM. Okay, and it turns out that this theta function has nice uh, properties. This transforms like Cz plus d to the power uh, n over 2. Theta a of z for gamma some matrix with lower entries Cd in some congruent subgroup gamma of sp2mz. Is it determinant? Uh, yes, otherwise it makes no sense. Yes. Um, yeah, thanks. And so it turns out that theta a is a Siegel modular form of weight n over 2 and degree or genus m. OK, so there is an, a natural motivation why we want to study such objects, because they are connected to representations of quadratic forms by quadratic forms. Um, we have seen that many, many of the formulas look exactly the same, but there are other formulas that don't look the same. So many things become more complicated. For instance, there is typically a formula for the imaginary part of gamma z. Um, which you can relate to the imaginary part of z. But here the formula looks much more complicated. It's cz plus d minus transpose imaginary part of z cz plus d bar inverse. Now, you recognize, of course, if everything, are no everything is numbers, then you get the usual formula imaginary part over cz plus d squared, absolute value. But here you can't do this, really, because it's non-commutative. And you can imagine that, that explicit formulas become very ugly uh, in this way. OK, there is a usual fundamental domain. Fundamental domain for sp2nz modulo hn, um, which looks very similar in some sense to the well-known case n equals 1. One needs Minkowski reduction theory. Um, well, yes. Well, this was okay. So, this is, was a motivating example, um, and now we continue with the with the usual theory, and we call the genus n. It just so happened that the genus here was m. Um, so this is perhaps pedagogically not optimal. 
OK, Minkowski reduction theory. Um, tells you that there is a fundamental domain such that the coordinates of the matrix X, Xij, are bounded by 1 half. And the Yij are Minkowski reduced, which means that the off diagonal is bounded by 1 half times the diagonal. And the diagonal is non-negative. In fact, it's strictly positive, and we can we have one half square root of three is bounded by y one is bounded by y two bounded by y n, and the determinant of y is roughly the product y one up to y n. In other words, the the um, the off diagonal um, is at least in terms of the determinant rather negligible. But that just describes conditions satisfying the fundamental domain. That's right. That's right. That's not not everything is in the fundamental. This is a, a, a Siegel set for the for the fundamental domain. The exact fundamental domain has not been worked out, uh, except for the case n equals two. So Gottschling, in his thesis, uh, 50, 60 years ago, uh, one of the last Siegel students, um, wrote down I don't know. 13 conditions or whatever, exact inequalities. 19? 19? That's what I remember. OK, maybe it's 19. Whatever. It's, it's, a, okay, it's still a manageable number, but, but pretty large. So there is a finite number of conditions for SP4. Um, but for higher genus, uh, I don't think every, no, so no one has ever worked out exact conditions for the fundamental domain. But it's not a finitely many sequence. Probably is, yeah, OK. But I think for, it's just in the case, as in the classical case, nobody needs that. I mean, um, if, if, you, I mean if you have a, a nice Siegel domain and you know that everything is inside the Siegel domain, then everything is OK. Um, OK, so how can I get back this blackboard? The book is on the right. Oh, oh, OK. OK, I'm supposed to stop anyway. But let me, um, let me just quickly say something about the Fourier expansion, because that's something that's very important in the SL2R case. And it turns out that the Fourier expansion for Siegel modular forms is much less useful. Um, there exists a Fourier expansion, of course, but it's, it's much less useful. Fourier expansion, a Siegel modular form has a Fourier expansion of the following type. One sums over symmetric matrices, positive definite, or perhaps positive semi-definite, and half integral, sum coefficient times E of trace Tz. Um, and it turns out that this coefficient a of t satisfies certain symmetries. For instance, uh, OK, so this is for a modular form of weight k. Um, there is a determinant u to the power k. a of u transpose t u for all u in GLNZ. So this is invariance by units, if you want. But it's less useful for n greater than 2, or greater than or equal to 2, less useful for n greater than 2. In particular, a of t, the Fourier coefficient, has no direct connection to Hecke eigenvalues. No direct connection with Hecke eigenvalues. I mean, that's something that we are very much used to, that Fourier coefficients are just Hecke eigenvalues. This is not the case as soon as the degree is not 1. Uh, if the degree is 2 or more, then there is no direct connection between Fourier coefficients and Hecke eigenvalues. So the Fourier expansion is, is really uh, much less useful. Um, one has the Hecke bound, at is bounded 
by the determinant uh, of t to the power k over 2, where k is the weight. Um, and the conjecture is that this is bounded by determinant t to the power k minus k over 2 minus n plus 1 over 4 plus epsilon. So if n equals 1, you can subtract a half. If f is not a lift, and I will explain next time what I mean by lift, is not a lift. We will do this tomorrow. But this is not known. Un unless in the case n equals 1 for, for holomorphic forms. What is known is this minus a delta. But delta is tiny. Delta is O of 1 over n. And we are actually expecting something linear in n. Um, so yeah, there is lots of things to do if you want to do, if you want to work on this. Um, there are lots of open questions. OK, I guess I have to stop now. So that's all for today. OK, are there any questions or comments? Yes? Uh, for hyperbolic space, do you exactly know what is the connection for like, uh, eigenvalues and the Fourier coefficients? Do we know what? Uh, the connection between Hecke eigenvalue and the Fourier coefficients. For in general, <coughs> HN, I mean. Um, I don't know. Um, certainly in the case n equals 3. Um, um, yeah, I don't know. There, there hasn't been much analytic number theory on these spaces. And I think it's, it's, it's now the time that uh, one introduces the methods of analytic number theory uh, for these types of automorphic forms. Yes? Uh, would there be any uh, consequence of analytic interest for the, if this conjecture was be true? Well, I mean, if n equals 2, uh, then this is the Ramanujan conjecture, right? And um, so certainly there is some interest in the Ramanujan conjecture. Um, um, yeah, I mean, whenever you work with the Fourier expansion and you want to have bounds, then it's certainly good to know what the best bounds are for the coefficients. And this is true on average. So um, in, in some mean square sense, this is true. But individually, it's not known. Um, and I think there is some fundamental interest in, in f knowing what the best possible uh, bounds are. Uh, and one of the problems is that this is, in fact, wrong uh, for certain forms that come from lower dimensional uh, symplectic groups. But I'll, I'll discuss this tomorrow. Yeah, okay. So the way to study representation of forms like forms. So. Yes, uh, yes. Study, uh, right. And so, right. Right, they, they go into the error, right, they go into the error term. So if you, right, then you have, you have Siegel's mass formula and the, um, so this, I mean, this is for cuspidal forms where the theta series are modular forms, but right. So these go into the error term, uh, these coefficients, and if you can bound the error term, then it's, it's certainly a good thing. Oh, it, it would prove as a principle for a more general problem uh, than the one that I discussed, which is, the representation of a quadratic of a, of a lattice of rank n uh, into a quadratic lattice of higher rank, and uh, yeah. So that, uh, what I explained yesterday has been that there has been progress in that case with Wellenberg and Venkatesh, but by different techniques. So I may have a comment that uh, so there's a very nice conjecture of Boucher for sp 4 z which relates its Fourier coefficients to twisted L values of spinoral functions. Yes. We certainly suggest that they are extremely arithmetic in, a, <coughs> in some sense, in an even more difficult way than Eka eigenvalues in that case. Yes. Yeah, yeah so, so they, they have certainly some intrinsic meaning. It, but they are not so much related to Hecke, but perhaps to other uh, arithmetic objects. Okay.
Is it possible to say Kahuna the spinner L function? So I will we talk about this. I will briefly mention L functions tomorrow. Um, but um, I'm, I, I'm, my plan is not to go into most details, but, but just to give you an overview of the objects that we are dealing with, so that you at least get an idea how to start if you're interested in working on these things. Okay, and there's one more question, and let's thank Francis.